Good morning to all. Good to see you. If you are visiting with us, we want to encourage you to stick around for a little bit after worship service. We'd love to meet you and to get to know you a little bit better. If you're from the area, we'd like to encourage you to make this your church home if you haven't won just yet. What a wonderful congregation Emporia Avenue is. I can testify to that. I am sure thankful for all the expressions of love within the last week. When last week uh, in the morning time, I got ill right during Pew Packers and I had to leave my post in order to go home and try to recover and I stepped out on my duties as song lead and then preaching last Sunday night and I had those that substituted very quickly. Tom uh, did the song leading within five minutes if you didn't know that. Last week he was up here and leading singing within the five to ten minutes of finding out and then Willie uh, substituted for me on Sunday night which I was supposed to be subbing for him and so he gave me the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Esther. The book of Esther, chapter 4, is where we'll begin this morning. Esther, chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 9, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. And Hathach came back and related to Mordecai, Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has one, but one law, that he is to be put to death unless the king holds out to him his golden scepter so that he might live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. And they related Esther's words to Mordecai. And then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not obtained royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded Three words that I would like for you to keep in your mind for our lesson this morning is preparation, perception, performance. Preparation, perception, performance. You ever wondered, why am I here? You say, I'm asking myself that right now. You say, why am I? Maybe you took a college class and you were fighting to stay awake in that early 8 a.m. morning class and you thought to yourself, how in the world did I ever allow somebody to convince me to enroll in such a class? Perhaps you just wonder why you are here in this place. What is it that God has planned for you? I know it's because of this lesson, but often in, in my life, I have asked myself that question, what plans does God have for me, and am I accomplishing those plans? And whenever I was younger, uh, in my teens and into my 20s, I had this forethought of once I reach my 30s, you know, Jesus began his ministry whenever he was 30, once I reach 30, then I will know beyond a shadow of a doubt what it is that God has planned for me and set out to accomplish it in short order. I mean, Jesus did it within three years. Well, I got to the age of 30, and still I wondered, and am I accomplishing? Is this what God desires for me? I reached 33, 34, and I still wondered. Now here I am at 42, and that same question goes through my mind again. Am I accomplishing what God intended for me? When Jeremiah was questioning the mission that God had given to him, God says, don't tell me what you can and cannot do, Jeremiah. I'm the one that made you. You just say what I tell you to say, and I will give you the strength. And I believe that in that, 
is the answer. It's not really that we know for certain what the future is, just like Esther doesn't know what the outcome of, of what her actions are going to be. If I perish, I perish, she says. It's not so much that we know for certain what the future is, but who it is that holds the future. Preparation, perception, performance. What do we know about these two Jewish individuals, Mordecai and Esther? And I purposely read that correspondence that's being relayed by Haythatch there between the two because it shows a dynamic between a father and a daughter, but they are not father and daughter, are they? In fact, you begin to read the book of Esther and you find out in short order that this is cousins. These are cousins that are corresponding with one another, and it's a much older cousin to a much younger Esther has lost her father and her mother. She is an orphan. That's a bad break. But yet she has fallen under the ward, under the guardianship of this godly, wise man, Mordecai. And he has raised her as a father would. The historical setting for where all of this is taking place is in Susa, which is in a foreign land. It's in the land of Babylon, in the land of the Chaldeans, and it's during a time whenever the Jews are allotted some freedoms. Thousands of them have already returned and gone back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the walls. The 70 years of captivity that Jeremiah prophesied about have already taken place, but it's there, there's a multitude of Jews that are still there within the land. And for the most part, they are sub, uh, subjugated to the powers that be, to the, the government. They are not slaves per se. Uh, they do have some freedoms, but they are looked down upon by the ones that control them, by the ones that used to have them as prisoners of war. And what you have in Esther is in story form, it's historical setting, but in story form, an explanation for the feast, which is either a one-day feast or a two-day feast, depending upon whether you were in the city or whether you were in the country, the feast of Purim or Purim. Uh, there's different ways of pronouncing that word. And it's a feast that was unique to this particular locality, unique to these Jews at this time. And it comes from the word pur, which means a lot or to cast lots. You remember they cast lots for Jesus' garments at the, the foot of the cross. Uh, this was something that we spoke about in the lesson on teraphim, how we saw the king of Babylon approach the fork in the road of how to decide in order to attack his enemy. And it said he shakes the arrows, and we compared that to the casting of lots. Most typically it is heathen nations that are practicing this casting of lots, but it's not necessarily to be seen simply within that because the disciples in Acts chapter 1, after they have... Uh, gathered all of the ones that meet the qualifications to uh, replace Judas, it says that they cast lots between the two and they came upon Matthias. And so even though uh, it is something that is practiced most generally by heathen nations, here it is Haman trying to determine what time in order to approach the king to do away with him, but it's not necessarily the case. So what you have within the book of Esther is an explanation for the Feast of Purim, but really it is a confrontation between two men of two different nationalities and origins, of two different faith backgrounds, and a personality conflict between the two, or at least it is perceived to be so, by Haman. Haman is an official within the king's court. And the king is Ahasuerus, also commonly known as Xerxes, a Persian king. And in the king's court, Haman has kind of become puffed up about his position and about his power and his authority. And even though he is not the king, he can still expect people to bow down to him as he goes by. But there is one who refuses to bow down to Haman. You know who that is. As Haman passes by, all the people bow down in honor to him, except for Esther's cousin, Mordecai. Talk about blowing things out of proportion. Haman is so angry with Mordecai 
that he wants to not only wreak havoc upon him, but he extends it to the entire Jewish nation living within that foreign land. And he decides through this casting of the poor that right, the right day in order to approach the king. And it's almost like reading your horoscope. And so he comes before the king and he says, Oh, king, there is a people that do not honor you. And I would like for you to grant me the ability to annihilate them. And if you will do that, I will put some money into the treasury and I will take care of this scourge upon our nation. Well, the king, being the deep thinker that he was, says, I like money. And I don't know if Xerxes has that type of accent. <laughs> Who doesn't need the deficit to be a little bit lower, right? He says, that sounds good. And so Haman gets the signet ring from the king and he makes this law that later on this year, and if you want to imagine the edict going out about this time of the year and then it not becoming fulfilled for another about 11 months later, and so in about March time, actually the Feast of Purim happened on March 11th of this year, and then that's going to be the time that it's going to be fulfilled. And the edict that goes out says specifically that the nation or the people or the tribe that is to be destroyed in all of the cities are the Jews because Haman knows that Mordecai is a foreigner, he's a Jew, he's an alien, he doesn't have any rights, he is simply one to be destroyed. The conversation that ensues that we read between Mordecai and Esther was Esther got news that Mordecai was sitting in sackcloth and ashes in the streets. And so she sends out her chief eunuch, the one that is over her, to say, go figure out what is going on with Mordecai. And this conversation ensues, and she learns that all of the Jewish people, not simply Mordecai, not just her cousin, but all of the Jews are threatened by this edict. And Mordecai has asked her to go before the king and to plead for the people, his people and her people. Now, what we know about Mordecai and Esther is spiritually they are prepared for what's happening within their life. How do you know that? Well, Jeremiah had told the people, keep your finger here in Esther and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah had said to the people, yes, you are going to go into captivity for 70 years, but there is a way that I want you to behave whenever you are in captivity, beginning in verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 29. I, and this is a, a great passage just to read at any time in general because of what God says to his people during a time of trial. But beginning in verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 29, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to the, all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and fathers, father sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may give birth to sons and daughters and grow in number there and not decrease. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its prosperity will be your prosperity. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets who are in your midst or your diviners deceive you and do not listen to their interpretation of your dreams which you dream for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For this is what the Lord says, 70 years have been completed for Babylon. When it has, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster, to give you a hope and to give you a, a future. Can you imagine having to preach such a lesson as that? God is saying that whenever you are ripped out of your city of Jerusalem, whenever you look back and you see it in ruins, whenever you see the pillars of smoke rising up from the ashes, I don't want you praying to me for the death of your enemies. I want you praying for their welfare. And as they drag you into that foreign land and you are bereft of your temple and you don't have your altar anymore to make sacrifices upon because you have seen that destroyed and all all that you have is a river by which to come down and to worship as a prisoner of war. Psalm 139, by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. God says, in that worship, I do not want you to be praying to me for deliverance. 
He says, I want you in that worship to be praying for the king because seven decades you are going and seven decades you will remain. I want you praying for the generals. I want you praying for the satraps and the presidents. He says, I want you to seek the welfare of whatever city it is that you are taken into. I want you giving your sons and your daughters in marriage and in marriage. And I want you to have this attitude of graciousness towards your enemy. What would you say to having such a sermon preached to you? It sounds an awful lot like sermons that Jesus preached, didn't it? As far as loving your enemy. We'd, we'd say, oh, he's a, he's a stooge for the king of Babylon. And they wish to do Jeremiah harm, in fact. What is God saying to his people? Have you ever been within the assembly whenever there is a young one that's having to be picked up by either mom or dad and carried out of the assembly? And as they're being carried out because they were misbehaving or they weren't listening to mom and dad, those pleas, those cries start to come from those, the, the young voices. Oh, no, don't spank me. No, I'm sorry, mom. I won't do it again. And your heart goes out. You ever been in the assembly whenever that happens? Your heart goes out to that young one, but you also want to support that parent too because you know that what they are doing is absolutely necessary and to simply listen to the pleas of the child is not always what is for best. And in fact, it is seldom what is best because correction is needed whenever there has been a misdeed. What God is, what, what Jeremiah is basically saying to the people before they go into captivity is God has decided to take you to the woodshed. Young people, that's a euphemism for getting a spanking. And none of your pleading is going to do any good and you might as well accept it because it's going to happen and it is for your good and it's going to last this long. It's kind of like a, a mom slapping the restrictions on the kids, you know, no screen time for two weeks, right? And before you know it, they don't have anything within, within their room whatsoever. We, we understand these things whenever we are talking about a parent and a child relationship. Uh, this is what God is trying to say to his people. He is trying to say, listen, let me elevate you out of this victim mentality of poor, poor, pitiful me and get you to see it from my point of view. He says, listen, this is going to happen. This is necessary and so you better accept it. And so I, I said all of that to come back now to Mordecai and to Esther and to say that they have prepared themselves up to this point within their lives for what God has in mind for them because Mordecai is within a foreign land, but he is still subject to the king. In fact, Mordecai saves Xerxes' life. There is a plot to kill Xerxes, and he foils that plot and informs the king, and the king's life is spared. Now, he's not going to bow down to Haman, right? Because that would be worshiping some, someone other than Jehovah God. That would actually be a conflict for his spiritual walk to bow down to Haman. But, 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 there is something else that is going on here. If you read back where it described who Haman was. Haman is called an Agagite. What in the world is an Agagite? Well, do you remember whenever King Saul is commissioned by God to go and to destroy the nation of the Amalekites, every single one? Don't, don't allow anyone to live. You bring back nothing. And Saul brought back the king. Do you remember what that king's name was? King Agag. Now, we're not for certain, but we think some way, somehow, Haman, the Agagite, is a descendant of King Agag from all these years, is carrying out those wishes of revenge upon the Jews some 500 years after the Israelites were commissioned to destroy them in full. And they didn't, evidently, if that genealogy holds up. And so we don't simply have one man against another, a local against a foreigner, but we have this feud possibly between an Amalekite and an Israelite that sparked 500 years ago and has grown into this blaze now some 500 years after the time of King Saul. Another coinkadink, Mordecai is from the tribe of Benjamin. That is the same tribe that Saul was from. And so this isn't just any Jew from the tribe of Benjamin even, it says, if you look at Mordecai's lineage there, it says that he was a son of Kish, the son of Saul. And so he's not just any Benjaminite, is he? Mordecai is a direct descendant centuries later of King Saul. How can man 
hold grudges for so long. How do we know that Mordecai is a man of God? Because he is submitted to a foreign king within a foreign land. And in some way, he has still found a place for himself. Whenever the king, and we're not going to get into Queen Vashti and what she did in order to lose her throne and Esther, what she, in order to come into royalty. But whenever the king bids for the virgins, the beautiful virgins of the land to be brought to him, Mordecai puts his cousin Esther forward as one to be part of the king's harem. And you might think, well, that doesn't make sense. Why, why would Mordecai I think that that would be anything that God would want for them to do, for, him, for her to be a part of his harem? And it's because God had said, and they were prepared with their minds, that this is the way that you act whenever you are in a foreign land. And Mordecai and Esther have both had that in their mind, and they are now fulfilling it. The second word is perception. They perceive now. Uh, Mordecai first and then Esther, but they perceive now we have clear action that we need to take. Esther, you go to the king even though that may mean your death because it was the law with this king. And in fact, this is a relief from that area, from Susa, of King Xerxes and his golden scepter that if he did not hold that out to you, if you came unto him unannounced or uninvited, and he says, who's out there? And you say, well, it's so-and-so. And he says, I didn't invite you. And he didn't extend his golden scepter. Then it was off with your head. Now, if you came in, who is there? And he says, okay, you can come in. Well, then even unannounced or uninvited, if he extended that golden scepter, then you were able to enter in. Wouldn't you like that for those phone calls, you know, that come in that you don't really care for, just the golden scepter rule, just one way or another, off with their heads. Well, Esther, she says, Mordecai, do you know what you're asking of me? Do you realize you are asking me to put my life on the line? And what is Mordecai's response? Who knows but that for such a time as this, that you were put into the position of royalty for such an occasion. And so what do we have taken place? Mordecai convinces Esther. There is that perception taking root. We are the children of God. We want to reconcile God's people to the king, and we are going to do our best to do that. Because if we neglect our responsibilities at such a time as this, though we didn't anticipate it, we didn't see it coming, but nonetheless, here the two of us are within this position, me to influence you, you to influence the king, that if we don't do it, God is still going to provide deliverance for his people, but we will suffer the consequences of perishing. And the faith of Mordecai that he is able to impress upon Esther, it really is astounding. And Esther says, okay, I, I see it from your point of view. Now, I understand what I need to do. And their perception then is to follow what they understand at this point in their life to be the will of God no matter where it leads. In fact, she says, if I perish, then I perish. Preparation, perception, and now performance. And now Esther begins the task, but what does she do first? She says, Mordecai, I want you and everybody that knows about this situation to fast, to not eat, not drink, morning or night for three days and pray that this will be a positive outcome. Now, do you think that Esther is saying, pray that I don't get killed? Or do you think that she is saying, and pray that the Lord will answer our call and deliver the Jews. I, I think that that's more of it because she has already here said, if I perish, I perish. She has already accepted the fact that I may die. I think she has also accepted that if in my death, somehow that causes for the deliverance of the Jews, well then may that be the way also. I may die, but you fast for three days and then she boldly walks into the outer court of the king to see if she will have her life spared and that he will listen to her. Well, the fact that there is a book to explain the reason for the Feast of Purim kind of gives it away right at the end because through the course of events, not only are the Jewish people delivered and able to kill a great number of their enemies, also the arch enemy, Mordecai's enemy, Haman, by the way, his name means I will overtop. 
he actually is hung upon his very gallows that he tried to hang Mordecai on. And Esther and Mordecai are then elevated to these positions of power. And in fact, the king removes that ring from Haman's finger that he used to make that edict. And he put it on Mordecai's finger so that Mordecai, though the law of the Medes and the Persians could never be removed and so that edict of the destruction of the Jews had to be steadfast and continue well then Mordecai was able to take that ring and make an edict and that says and the Jews can be provided whatever they need to defend themselves and on that day that they are to be attacked they can defend themselves and take the spoil of whomever they kill and it says that many believed in Judaism because of the fear of the Jews you know they have some time here in between uh, probably about a six-month period where the Jews are reinvigorated by the work of Esther and Mordecai. And not only are they spared, but they are victorious within this foreign land. And they establish this feast, the Feast of Purim, which is basically celebrating God's deliverance of his people. Do you know what is really unique about the book of Esther? Not a single time. In the book of Esther is Elohim, Lord, uh, Jehovah, Yahweh. Not a single time is God's name used. And Mordecai actually bears the name of a false god. The god of the Babylonians and, and the Persians. The god of Murdoch. Remember how... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had Jewish names before they came to Babylon, and then they gave them, the, uh, Daniel even had, I think it was Belshazzar or something, something like this was Daniel's name. We don't know what Mordecai's Jewish name is, but we do know that the name that he is wearing, no Jewish mother would have given to their child because it's in honor of a grievous false god. And so that's a bit ironic, isn't it? That in the entire book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned once. And here Mordecai, one of the deliverers of the people, is bearing the name of a false god. And yet through it all, God works out a way to deliver his people through these two individuals, through these two cousins who were prepared to do his will, who perceived the, poem, the moment in which they needed to act, and they performed upon it. Well, what's the lesson for us today? Well, first, I need to know, am I prepared and how do I get prepared? Well, what do we know about Esther and Mordecai and what they had knowledge of? The, script, the scroll of Jeremiah. They had that. They knew God's will through Jeremiah and that was some hundred years. We think that the time period of Esther is somewhere a hundred years to 150 years after the time of Jeremiah. And we know that they knew what God expected of them because they were performing it. The only way that you and I can understand what it is that God desires of us is to have it taught to us. It is to read it and to study it and to take it to heart. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, study. Show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that doesn't simply mean I know right from wrong, although that's part of it. That, that just doesn't simply mean that I know that there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. How many divisions are in the Old Testament? How many divisions are in the New? That doesn't simply mean that you can turn to the scriptures and base your arguments upon those passages that you can find and to defend your faith. But in what we are seeing here, in light of what we are discovering with Esther and Mordecai, that means that you have to make application. You have prepared your mind to not only know what God's will is within your life, you're doing your best to understand, to perceive, and waiting for those opportunities whenever you can implement and do what God has desired. You're prepared because just like with Esther and Mordecai, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We may never fully know what God expects of us or what it is that I am supposed to accomplish or what, who it is that I am supposed to have influence upon that generations from, from now might have influence upon untold number of people. All I know is that I have the obligation to know God's word and to study it and to prepare myself so that whenever the time comes, I can see it and I can be ready to walk through that door with what type of attitude of personal sacrifice, even if it costs me my life. I will stand for God and I will stand for his people. I will do my best to reconcile God's people to the king 
because that's my duty. And I pray and I study and I pray and I inquire and I search and I live the life that I, I can to the best of my ability that the Lord wants me to in his service, doing what I understand, not the things that I don't, but doing those things that I understand. You know, that's the one thing that we did as children of God, that we came to understand that baptism is something that God requires, that it is through the watery grave of baptism that I come into contact with that blood. And perhaps that was the one big concept that you had within your mind. And you did it because you, you knew this is something that I can do. I don't know what my life holds. I don't know the places that I'm going to go. I don't know who I'm going to talk to, who will receive the things that I say and who will reject them. But all I know is I can do this because I have understood it and, and I have acted upon it, and we were baptized, and we had our sins washed away, and we were raised to walk a new life. Did we then know all of the plans that God had for us? Today, do you know all those things that God has in mind, the plans that he has, what he will accomplish or will not accomplish within us, within the days ahead, if I have days, within the years? But we prepare ourselves with knowledge. We seek understanding so that we can have that perception and then we act upon it, what we know to be right. And even at great personal sacrifice to ourself. Preparation, perception, performance. Am I in the mold of Mordecai? Are you in the mold of Esther? Am I willing to be subject to the heavenly king? And only you can answer that because only you understand what you have by way of knowledge and understanding of God. And what I encourage you to do is not to make excuses because you are surrounded by foreigners uh, or that you feel like everyone is looking down on you or that you don't have any understanding or that you don't have any power of your own, that you're just moving at the whims of others. What I ask of you is simply to act upon what you know to be right. Because God is a God of love and a God of understanding. And there are times in our life whenever we struggle, whenever we don't feel like he is listening, whenever we feel like we are suffering things un unduly, whenever we have asked God for deliverance and it doesn't come. And it may be simply that we are experiencing those things that are self-inflicted. And in that case, God will say, well, get off your hobby horse pity party. Stop making excuses and do what you know to be right. I have plans for you, for your welfare, and for your good, if you will but obey. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?